hey, this is Wicked Good from Off Curve, where I talk about Hearthstone on my drive home from the train station. But I'm not doing that right now, because I'm listening to Coin Conceive. And so are you. What a coincidence. What good taste you have. Greetings. Hello. Greetings. My greetings. Well met. I greet you. Greetings, traveler. Greetings, friend. The pleasure is mine. Hello and welcome to episode 136 of Coin Concede, a Hearthstone podcast dedicated to making the competitive side of the game more accessible to you. I am your host and anchor, Ridiculous Hat, hailing from Gadget Zan, New York. And when I say hailing, I mean yesterday there was actually hail. I don't know how that happened in May, but here we are. It's fine. From Karazan, California, we have our friend and the Star Wars co host of the podcast, Mr. Bodicus. How are you doing, Bot? Good. How are you doing, Hat? I am a okay, doing all right. And it's fun. We... There's a lot of exciting stuff uh, happened this week. I'm excited to talk about it today. Oh yes. Well, like one really big exciting thing. <laughs> um, but yes, there's the great time. The great thing about this time in Hearthstone, there's always something to talk about because it's kind of the season of change. But sometimes we like it when things are just the way we remember them. Do we know anyone else that might be able to uh, help us describe that? Oh yes. It's our friend from Thunder Bluff, Louisiana, one Cinder Ascendant. How you doing? I'm I'm good. <laughs> it's oh man, uh, this is so weird. It's so weird and uh, a little deja vu. -y. Yes. Well, we had to meet our quota of a single Louisianian, and Appa yes. unfortunately had well not unfortunately Appa was there when his girlfriend, the wonderful Taylor, uh, graduated from dental school and is now uh dr taylor so yep that's awesome but of course that's a little bit more important than this year i mean it's like slightly more a, a slight ever so slightly yes a little bit just a little bit a and little bit. that's the tooth and cinder is <laughs> leaving us now it. yeah i already regret coming back <laughs> yeah. yay cinder can be the straight guy straight man this uh that is never going to happen. I don't. I just. <laughs> I need to burst your bubble now. Yeah. It's Cinder has admitted. I mean, there's a love of puns. <laughs> it's absence makes the heart grow punter. You get the idea. You get the idea. <laughs> I, I'm Move sensing on. so. I'm sensing so much regret. Right yes. Now. <laughs> we're we're moving on pretty dramatically. Um, but good to have you back, Cinder. Thank you so much for coming on well, the show you. today. And in fact, let's talk a little bit about what you've been up to yeah i guess so well first and, of all know, that, go ahead first of all no you 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 make the pitch okay I'm well yes this time well cinder <laughs> we obviously know you but for those listeners that may have only come on the last few months tell us a little bit about your history in the uh in your involvement with coin concede historically and why we're all so happy to have you on well um Back around episode 25, that's that's a large number uh, of episodes ago, um, uh, Kevin was one of the original hosts, left the show. Uh, Cora started to explore her uh, her career in casting, uh, and Kenny was kind of uh, floating the boat, and he was looking for new casters to come and help out. Uh, and I threw my, my name in the hat, uh, no pun intended, and he said yes, and I was I was with uh, you all for right around seventy, so about eighty episodes, I think. And then I started to uh, explore some opportunities in casting as well. Uh, so that's probably a good transition to the next question, which is what I, what have I been doing since I left? <laughs> Actually, the next question was going to be: Did you call her Cora the Explorer on purpose? I don't know that I oh. I did. You did. I didn't mean to. Okay. Well, I wanted to just say I'm so proud of you, and now we can no. less seamlessly transition. Um, you've been very involved in a couple different Hearthstone leagues, uh, THL and UHL, and really a lot of that is based on the content production and the casting. Um, well, Before we even get into what you've been doing, how do you kind of find yourself involved with these leagues and, and the... Uh, the way that you integrated yourself into them? 
Uh, THL was your fault. Um, you wouldn't shut up about oh, yeah. it, so I decided to give it a try because hmm. um, really organized play is is my my most favorite place to be with just about any game. Uh, so I wanted to try it out, and team competition is something that's kind of unique in Hearthstone, so I decided to try out for Team Hearth League. Uh, I got signed to a team immediately, uh, quite by accident, I think, to a team called PrepCoin Concede. Uh, and I've been home there ever since. In fact, I joined a second team for the last year of Standing League, uh, and then for some reason got talked into uh, creating content for THL as well. So then I started making overlays and casting and uh, doing all that kind of stuff. Um, and you know, one of the things I had discovered while at Coin Concede uh, was that I really, really love casting. It's a ton of fun. I love to do it, and I wanted to do it a lot more. Uh, so that that was in no small part uh, part of what got me drifting away from the podcasting realm uh, because I wanted to do more of it. And um, THL launched into UHL. Uh, I'm, Bodicus had approached me when UHL was going into season two and said, hey, they are looking for casters. Would you want to? And I'm like, uh, yeah. And uh, he says... <laughs> Bodicus asked me, if there's anybody you like to cast with, uh, you know, you can bring them along, but don't ask Appa. I've already asked him. I said, well, and I have nothing left to add to this conversation. <laughs> so uh, Appa and I have uh, been sometimes casting as a team and sometimes separately. Um, but but uh, yeah, that's, that's where I've been. I've been trying to cast anything and everything I can get my hands on. I'm even talking to some other organizations about some actual professional casting Although I uh, haven't signed any data lines yet, but um, I'm getting there. It's it's slow. Uh, it's it's one of those things where you gotta you gotta get it when you can get it because it's it, it's a it's a difficult thing to pin down. There's not a lot of casted events, so uh, you know anything firesides, challenger cups, leagues leagues have been of course have been really good for me. So, um, but yeah, but that's what I've been doing. Been uh, trying to cast my torrent butt off. And have so far successfully done so. Yeah, I was actually really excited this last Saturday because we were finally going to get the chance to uh, to cast together, and then unfortunately we're not it able to. So, but we will we will get that done. I, I'm real excited. I uh, as soon as I uh, Ferris kind of said that I was going to be doing a lot of casting for season two and asked me if there was anybody that came to my mind that could also do some casting. You were the first person that, that I thought of. I watched your, so you think you can cast video with Appa. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, uh, he'd be an awesome addition if he's available. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm real excited that you've become involved in the UHL. It's been a lot of fun. Same, same for me. I'm, I'm glad that uh, Ferris gave me a shot because it's been a lot of fun so far. I firmly agree. It's well, and we can talk about we can talk about the leagues a little bit. Uh, the involvement that you've had has kind of been really explosive in the past six months or so. Um, what's been your experience with these league interactions? You can talk about them separately or together. And is it different than what you expected? It's and what do you think of kind of the growth of this segment of the Hearthstone play sector? I think leagues are starting to or not starting to but but have been uh filling a gap uh somewhere in the competitive hearthstone sphere because there's a huge huge gap a huge jump from just sitting at home playing ladder by yourself and maybe going to the occasional fireside to competing uh in in the hct there's there's this huge this huge opening where there's room for people who are actually very good at the game, uh, but don't have the time or maybe don't have uh, the ability to take the financial risk uh, to get into the Hearthstone Championship Tour, uh, but to have organized play for people who would do well and would enjoy it. And leagues have really been uh, kind of fitting, floating the bill for those folks, at least you know for for the few leagues that are out there. And I, I think that there is definitely room for more of them uh and i would i really hope that blizzard takes notice of, of these kind of things because they have the fireside program which is kind of it really is just blizzard gives you a stamp of approval and whatever happens happens there's no there's no formal organization to it 
So maybe with the the onset of uh, the the quote unquote tournament mode that's supposed to should have happened last month actually, um, maybe Blizz can start picking up uh, some you know some slack on this and getting a, a, a semi volunteer program working where people can organize leagues through the client something like that. But right now that doesn't exist. It's all done uh, by volunteers on their own time just because they want to do it. Uh, so hopefully. Hopefully it continues to grow, but I think Blizzard needs to be a part of that growth. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you think about it that a fireside is kind of the physical analog in the digital game. It's all about getting people together, and that's a wonderful thing. But embracing the game's social and digital nature, a virtual fireside of some sort that you can check into, would just it would make so much sense. I, I do hope, I mean, you know, every single Hearthstone podcaster said tournament mode, tournament mode, tournament mode for the past since 19 always um yep. has been talking about tournament mode so obviously we very much want that but i think that you're onto something there it's we have all these grassroots efforts to get people together and yet the game just doesn't support the idea of maybe we can have people together in a virtual sense as opposed to a physical sense so good perspective there now as far as casting goes how has it been different doing casting on this level than what you expected? What's been what's been the biggest thing that you didn't expect coming into it? The one thing that I think, and and I I kind of knew, but this is something that I don't think a lot of people understand that casting is very hard work. Like it's it's not just sitting there and, and talk stoning, but it's it's a process of of trying to make the game entertaining and accessible to people. It's, it's trying to constantly be aware of your partner and, and, and stoke the chemistry and make sure that there is a conversation rolling. Uh, and for a lot of casters who are doing this stuff independently, it's also operating the streams uh, for the organizations, you know, like sitting on the, the, your open broadcast system and actually streaming the match. And in addition to, uh, talking about it, so it's 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 a lot of work and it's and it's exhausting. Um, so it's something that you really kind of have to find it very rewarding, which thankfully I do. I, I love to cast, and I can if if my voice holds up, I will cast all day if I could. Um, but yeah, that's I think that's the one thing that's most surprising to people is just how difficult it is. They think they can just jump in front of a mic and talk stone a bunch, but you. Just, kind of get going and you're not really sure how to do it like there is there is a process there is a skill to it uh that, that you have to learn there is a learning curve involved um and i think the other thing that surprises a lot of people uh is just how hard it is to concentrate on the game while you're casting uh you know casters get a lot of flack for like missing lethal and forgetting the name of a card and you know details like that but it is really difficult to analyze a game state while trying to uh announce that game state to an audience and to your partner uh so like if 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 you ever try to do it you know maybe just just get a friend and and watch an hct match even like a vod and just try to go back and forth narrating the game and also try to, to watch what's going on at the same time. You can see exactly uh, how demanding it is of, of your attention. Uh, it's, it's definitely something that you can't pick up right away. You got to practice at it. Yeah, that those are a ton of great points there. I, I was just also going to say, like, when when you're doing casting for these like kind of homegrown leagues that we've been doing, it's since you don't have all that production value that a lot of the HCT guys have, you have to be communicating with the players, trying to communicate with your co-host, also doing all the transitions, all of the setup, and even like the smallest detail uh, can get lost sometimes. Yep. Um, so yeah, I, it's been a big learning experience just trying to get into that, and, and you do a great job oh, of it. I also uh, got to cast with Brasky last week, and he's just... Oh, he's so good. He's really good at, at keeping everything flowing and making sure the stream looks great and everything, so uh, it's been a lot of fun, yeah. Yes, who knew a professional voice actor and trained audio <laughs> and stage person would be good at casting, but that just kind of shows the level of pedigree you need to make it look easy. Um, yeah. it's difficult. It's, it's like juggling, except every so often the balls change either weight or direction or both. Um, cause you also have to, you have to be proactive and reactive simultaneously. So totally agree that I think both of you do a wonderful job at it, but it's also, 
from from my very limited experience with it, keeping it going and not just having it being you talking with your friends about the game, but actually making content is a subtle but really significant shift in how it's presented. So thank you for that insight on it. Keep up the casting. And now you oh. get to put that voice to the test for the most difficult question okay. we have. <clears throat> Got it. List I'm ready. all the animals in your house. Uh, by name or by species? If you can do by name, we'll take by name, but it's description and species are the important parts. Okay, so there are seven dogs, uh, and I'm going to go in size order because that's the easiest. Uh, so there's Serenity, uh, Sophie, Trixie, Gypsy, uh, Miranda, Bebe, and Sadie. There are three cats. Uh, they are Daisy, not Sadie, uh, Obama, the cat president, and Turd Ferguson. Uh, then we... <laughs> we we have it's a funny name uh we have fish that are not named and i will not name them but there are three there are three fish tanks and two betas actually the the betas are named uh there's uh taco and chimichanga um we have uh, one snapping turtle named zaria uh she is only with us long enough to grow out so we can release her in the wild because snapping turtles can take your arm off uh so that we we just rescued her and, and took her out of a dangerous situation uh, we have a frog outside. His name is Frogo. Uh, he lives in the pond with the goldfish. Uh, we have three guinea pigs. Uh, they are Pig Widgeon, uh, Gandalf Greybutt, uh, and the third one is still just Pig because we haven't named her yet. Uh, we have uh, our girlfriend's rabbit, uh, whose name is Bastila. We have a snake named Salazar. And a single hermit crab who is not named because I can't tell them apart when I have more than one. And I think that's it. Uh, are you sure that's just <laughs> I'm, it? I'm inventorying the. Oh, I, I did forget. I forgot the bearded dragon that is Nymphadora. Wow. I'm, I'm trapped between saying that's a lot of animals and <laughs> Turt Ferguson. <laughs> Turt Ferguson. It's funny. You got to say the name. It's a funny name. It's a funny name. It's a funny name. Yes, what was, do you want? Was the first cat literally the what? What was the first cat's name? Uh, Daisy. Daisy's a, well. The first okay. one I named was Daisy. I, uh, okay, I thought her name was Daisy, not Sadie. Yes, well, <laughs> like because when name. we adopted her, her shelter name was Sadie, and we already had a Sadie, so I just reversed the uh, hard sounds and called her Daisy <laughs> instead. Okay. Ah, uh, syllable swapped. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, and then, it's Gandalf the Gray Butt. Gandalf gray butt uh, because she has a she, the, she's solid white and has a gray butt. That's I don't know what I expected. <laughs> <laughs> just a just has a gray butt. That's it. It's no, it's that you were you were very clear about what was going on there. Um, I am in awe of both your pet management and casting ability to maintain focus throughout all of that. Um, <laughs> It, it is clear it, you were. It actually makes yeah. a lot of sense because you can kind of keep. You're keeping all of the pets like taken care of and also taking care of all of the streaming at the same time. Like you're able yeah. to multitask very well. I can tell. Yes. Well, Wicked Good calls scheduling, scheduling matches or really scheduling anything in large groups is really just hurting cats. And we've got mm -hmm. some very experienced cat herding going on here. So. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm pretty practiced at it. Well. The last question, do you want to do a podcast? I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm already here, right? Thank you for answering. So we're, so That's a doing. yes. So <laughs> tell me about your ladder experience, Mr. Cinder. How are you doing on ladder? Uh, I will be honest. I have been fairly demotivated by ladder lately. Uh, I think the, the meta, while balanced, is a little boring. Um, and I, it's the, the, there's a pretty consistent rock, paper, scissors, and you can go a single day and hit all of your bad decks. And, if, and as Hearthstone goes, as soon as you switch, you get immediately countered. Um, so I've, I've, I started the month at eight and I'm still at eight. However, I have quadrupled quintupled down on organized play. So I am now in four different leagues. Um, I'm doing I'm doing five best of fives every week. Wow. And I, I love it. I do two for a team hearth league. I do the, the coin can see listener league, of course. Uh, and I'm also doing the mysterious challenger league. So, yeah, that's a lot. Wait. So, oh, you're doing mysterious challenger league. How's that going? I am doing. Uh, I'm currently two and oh, nice. 
For those that don't yeah. know, Team Hearth League is obviously a team sport, and then Mysterious Challenger League is all about uh, single-player play in, in an environment that's typically team-suited, and it's brand, brand new. So, of course, I just couldn't resist asking my buddy Sender how it's going. Yeah, I, I've, I'm doing better this, this season than I have in previous seasons. I think my my game record was something like 35% in the last couple of seasons. Uh, I am off to a 65% start this season, so I'm hoping to keep that going forward. Well, um, it makes sense. I mean, it, right now, there's polarizing opinions on the meta, which we'll talk about in a little bit, of course, as to uh, where those opinions have gone, but... Uh, but involving oneself in the community around Hearthstone, I've maintained, has always been the way to stay interest with the game when the game itself is not providing that interest. So, um, but man, that's a lot of best of fives. That's that's twenty five matches a week. Uh, well, twenty five potentially twenty five games. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, most people will do twenty five games in the course of like a a session or two. So yeah. I don't feel like it's that much. It's it's more prep. There's a lot of prep involved, and uh, trying to remember which matchup chart i'm building for which league <laughs> spreadsheets are my friend yes but you got to make sure you keep track of all the data and you don't want to miss mix up conquest and lhs because that would be bad no. yeah. yeah um Bodicus, how's your ladder buddy so i've been shopping at hagatha's value shaman shop Ooh. It, it is a place where you get all your spells for free but still end up paying full price for all of them and by, of course, what this means is uh, I started. I was playing a bunch of tier one decks, just trying to trying to ladder up, and I had like relatively positive win rates with everything, but none of them felt great. Like even Shaman, Cube Block, Mind Blast Priest. Mind Blast Priest felt like pretty good, but um, I started playing Asmodai and Tice's uh, Shutterwalk Shaman deck, and uh, started getting some ideas and basically it was playing grumble at first and every time i played shutterwalk and grumble returned like a bunch of stuff to my hand usually my hand was so full i wouldn't actually get the shutterwalks back and i was kind of thinking to myself you know why am i trying to combo off when it's so hard to when your hand is always full so i would rather just have these shutterwalks in play so i made a few changes to the deck and instead of going for like the full combo build, I'm going for kind of a value generation build. And it's been going really well. Um, I keep kind of making alterations here and there. And I'm just I'm just really enjoying the deck because you just your hand is always full and you have so many things you can do, even if sometimes the things you can do are not very good. <laughs> um, it's just a lot of fun, uh, a lot of fun to play. And I'm winning with it. So uh, that's what I've been doing. And you know what? I I am of the opinion that that is the correct way to build for Shutterwalk. Not not the OTK, but just try to present him as a late game threat. Because like if you do it even modestly correctly, you'll get like basically three Tyrians out of Shutterwalk. It's it's pretty good. And like freeze the board and do a couple other things. So yeah, I I like that build. Yeah, and also I do play a Zola, so you have yep. a small chance to be able to just get another Shutterwalk in your hand, but you just never have to worry about only getting one in play when there are so many situations where you just need to kind of threaten like a Warlock or something, because a lot of times what the Warlocks are trying to do, I've been playing against a lot more uh, Control Lock, and they try to Azari you out and when they're going through that, I'd rather just have a board of three shutter walks threatening to kill them and force them to twisting nether and then kind of just keep presenting, you know, scary boards that if they ever go for a Zari, you just kill them with a bloodlust, you get off Hagatha. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's been working pretty well for me. Yeah, that makes sense. It's I maintain that Hagatha is the most fun card of the Witchwood and one of the most fun cards printed in a while. And there are a lot of shaman spells that People started off reviewing the set saying that shaman spells are bad, and I don't think that's true, but I do think that you wouldn't ever put them in your deck when you're building your deck, because they might be too narrow, or they might be not good in small quantities, but in Hagatha, you just get a bushel full of spells, and there's a really big difference between bad and not correct to put in your deck when you build it, and I think that Hagatha kind of illustrates the difference there in that a lot of these spells, Forked Lightning, has been so good for me sometimes, but I'd never play it in a, in a deck. You just have it sometimes like, oh, this is really good right now. 
and cryostasis i'm yeah. just like this card everybody hates this card but every once in a while i find uses for it and like it actually the the spell suite just feels somewhat balanced there's like a balanced amount of removal a, just a tiny bit of life gain and a little bit of value cards and then removal and you know stuff like that so like over the course of many turns of having Hagatha in play, you can kind of sculpt your game around getting, in general, uh, kind of a set number of, of each card. And as long as you don't just hit the same card over and over again, then um, it, it's a fairly... It feels, like, consistent, even though the, the spells you're getting are inconsistent. And it's actually funny how often I'm just, like... I really kind of just want a ancestral healing right now because I need a I need a free card that I can just get out of my hand and not even if it's like not really doing anything. Yeah, I was watching your stream the other day when you rolled totemic might, totemic might, totemic might, ice fishing volcano, and the volcano Ouch. won you the game, but the totemic mites did nothing <laughs> other than getting out of your hand, and they did boost a spell power totem once, and it was worth it. Yeah. Uh, I actually sometimes totemic might gets you in trouble because you don't want to buff your totems because you need your totems to die for when you shutter walk because you don't want shutter walk to Zola back a totem to your hand. Yeah. But um, yeah, that that was the game where my last creature had to get a volcano out of it so that I could clear the board against a big spell mage and then neither of us had anything in play and they died to fatigue. <laughs> Oh, right, because it was a manatee totem and you were both in fatigue. So if it didn't hit exactly <laughs> volcano, you were going to die to it. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And they had a they had a water elemental in play. So they so even if I had just like left the water elemental in play, the amount of healing they were doing, plus the damage they were doing would have put them ahead. But I was ahead or they were ahead in fatigue. So by clearing everything, I was able to win that game. It was silly. It was a goofy it was, thing. It was silly. But walking through that sentence of sometimes Totemic Might is bad because you don't want your shutter walk to trigger Zola, it's like, what is going on? Um, I, I will say the deck is like pretty complicated. I I feel like my win, win rate has been pretty good, but if I got better at sequencing everything and knowing exactly how to play all my cards, it would be even better. So I'm looking for this deck to be pretty good uh, after all the nerfs hit. Yeah, I well... And we'll talk about the nerfs in a little bit, but I think there's just so much opportunity for the meta to open up, and we'll get into that. I'm not going to jump too far ahead here. Um, I'll talk briefly about my own experiences. I hit Legend last week, as I discussed, so this week I've been... I keep losing the Q block, and I can't win with it, so I spent a few days just saying, I'm going to learn how to play this, and I spent you know a couple nights just losing every game I could, and the deck is really, really, really difficult to play optimally. And then I spent a day on stream, like, doing okay with it and winning. And then the nerfs were announced. And I'm like, well, guess I'd better do something else with my time. Um, there goes that idea. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I spent the time to learn it. I just wish that wasn't, like, learning a language that doesn't exist anymore. Like, it's, I feel like I'm now fluent in Prussian. Um, I think it's pretty aggressive to say it doesn't exist anymore. But we'll definitely yeah. talk about that later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not quite in the same form. But yes, you're right. Um, so instead... Steve, Wicked Good was talking about playing Control Priest. And I'm like, hmm, Control Priest, huh? Y'all got any more of them life drinkers? Got any holy fires? And it turns out that Sen of Glass was playing a list that Meaty took to Top 10 Legend that was basically Burn Control Priest, which is like the Mind Blast Priest, except it plays life drinkers and holy fires. And then it got refined a little bit by Monsanto, who basically made a dragonless somewhere between Raza and Freeze Mage, and that it's all board control, card draw minions, and kill you stuff with Anduin and Alex at the top. And then Casey modified it even further today by including Holy Smites. And the title of the deck is Don't Geist Me, Bro. So, the, uh... It feels so much like Raza Priest without Raza that it's both sickening and somewhat comfortingly familiar and so i've been trying that out it's really good it plays it spirit lash and it's really really good spirit lash is so fantastic right now it's like master blaster priest right yes uh, that's what it yeah. reminded me of from uh Velen's chosen they called it master blaster priest 
Yeah, well, that was Zedalot's build from last season. This is even more aggressive in that it is straight up not trying to fight for the board. It doesn't play Dustbreaker. It doesn't play Primordial Drake. It's it's straight up draw cards, stop from dying when I have to and only when I have to, and then critical mass of burn over a short period of time that you can't stop or kill me during. And it's really effective, and I imagine that we'll be seeing that around for a while after after the nerfs go into play. I hope so. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so we said nerfs a bunch of times. We haven't talked about the news yet. Bodicus, why don't you take us into Newsland? So it's here. The Hearthstone finally announced the upcoming balance changes uh, coming out most likely uh, next week because they are. We're waiting for the last set of HCT, the uh, Asia Pacific region, to finish their kind of preliminary events. I, I forgot what they call them now, but uh, the equivalent to the prelims uh, this weekend, and then. These balance changes are going to come out. It's actually going to be the topic of our Dexplanation segment, but I will go over them very quickly. Uh, Naga Sea Witch will be going up from 5 to 8 mana. Spiteful Summoner will now cost 7 mana, up from 6. Dark Pact is only going to restore 4 health instead of 8. Possessed Lackey going up from 5 to 6 mana. And Call to Arms going up from 4 to 5 mana. And the last thing is the Caverns Below quest reward is now your minions will become 4-4s four instead of 5-5s. Five fives. So uh, we have a link to the um, to the Hearthstone main site that has all of these changes in there if you want to go check it out. We also have a link a little later in these show notes for an interview uh, on IGN where Dean Ayala and Peter Whalen kind of weigh in and talk a bit about the uh, the nerfs that happened. And you can get a lot of insight into kind of their thoughts and why they did what they did for um, for each of the cards. It was actually a super in-depth and very long article, um, but but I enjoyed it. Uh, Hat, I believe you linked this to me. Did, what did you think of this article? It was a really great read to kind of get an in-depth perception about what the devs are thinking. And I feel like we're actually seeing the dawn of Ixar's Hearthstone. That's Dean Ayala, for those that don't know, over Broad's Hearthstone. Um, and there's always going to be a subtle shift in execution when we have a new person taking over the reins. Um, Broad brought Hearthstone from non-existent into the giant that it is today, and it's wildly successful. But Ixar has been around since the beginning as well. And I think the first major thing that we notice is that Broad made it a point to say he didn't believe in talking about nerfs before they were formally announced, and he wanted that time between the nerf announcement and the game being changed to be as short as possible, which I think is reasonable. He said, it feels really bad when Blizzard tells you that your game is broken, but not how they're going to fix it or when they're going to fix it. And that's, you know, it's a reasonable point because since... When Ixar was talking about the uh, the some of the cards that might have been ner- that they were considering nerfing on Reddit, and it was posted on the Hearthstone page later that day that nerfs will, will be coming, but they'll be after the playoffs, after the summer playoffs. There there came this kind of wave of speculation combined with disillusionment. I think that Broad's prophecy came true that people knew something was wrong but weren't sure what, and we're just saying, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? But this kind of openness and transparency is something the community's asked for in the past, and we do get to see kind of the speed of the thought process. They've been moving on these nerfs very quickly in a very short period of time, and they even considered preemptive nerfs before the rotation, which I think really gives a level of insight into the into the design process that players hadn't had before and shows just how closely that the devs are monitoring the gameplay experience. So... I, I thought it was a great read and really insightful and also really reassuring that even with Broad gone, there's still a steady hand on the wheel. 
Yeah, another thing I noticed was they were when they were talking about the Naga Sea Witch nerf is they were that one has seems to have been like in on the radar for quite a while. Um and they really took their time with it and they were willing to let something that is cool. I mean, I've played the Naga Giants deck. I think it's kind of cool the first couple times you go go off with it, but kind of let it see if it's going to pan out to be one of these decks that kind of everybody's playing. And then once they finally found out that, okay, this deck's not going away, now we're going to kind of nuke it into orbit, as Hat likes to say. Um, I, I, I kind of liked the, that explanation. Uh, what, what did you think of, of this article, Cinder? Uh, I was going to comment on the article itself, but, but Hat said something I kind of want to uh, bounce off of. You, you're noting that this seems kind of like the transition from the Ben Brode era to the Dean Elia uh, era. And I, I don't know that Dean is going to be the face of Hearthstone, but if he's becoming a more prominent force in the development uh, and you know the ongoing health of the game, that's super interesting because if you know the history of Ben Brode, Ben Brode came from another game, I forget which, in Blizzard, and he was just kind of brought on as you know, a guy, you know, project manager, kind of a vague, you know, leadership position. Uh, Dean has been part of the balance team uh, since he's been there, and he's been there for years, I think since the beginning. So that, that that's a very different philosophical place to come from as as a, a, a person of leadership. So this, the fact that uh, XR was able to, or willing to come out and talk openly about the, the philosophy of the nerfs, uh, I think, is is really indicative of that potential shift in leadership paradigm. Um, but so, yeah, interesting observation there, Hat. But as for the article itself, uh, I, I like the fact that they were super honest about the fact that these cards, yes, these cards are doing what we want them to do. Yes, we want Spiteful Summoner to summon like, like anywhere from 12 to 20 points uh, for e attack and health. Uh, it would, but it's just happening a little too fast. So we're going to slow it down by, by a mana. We're going to give other decks another turn to start catching up to these combo pieces and these power plays, uh, which I think is, is kind of an interesting philosophy. I think we've seen in the past nerfs have been a little more heavy handed at times. Uh, like the, the quest rogue, the original quest, quest rogue change was, was quite significant going from four to five minions that, that changed the scope of the deck entirely. Uh, we saw Warsong Commander uh, get completely obliterated. Uh, you know, they they just changed her function completely. Um, so this is just more of like, yes, we, we were we were close to where we wanted to be in the design. We just want to slow the game down a tad. So I I, I like that incremental uh, approach to trying to adjust the speed of the game and adjusting the meta that way. Yeah, it seems very important to them that you, if you build a deck like Q Block and you enjoy playing Q Block, even if you're a very small minority of the player base and the majority of the player base hates uh, the deck like Q Block, uh, you're still going to have a deck that you can play after the nerfs. It's not going to completely ruin all all of this time that you've spent, you know, putting into it. It, it just trying to get it into like this narrow power band as as I heard Ben Brode say once in a in one of his videos uh, he was talking about why they don't buff cards is because you're they're trying to get as many cards into a pat what kind of like a power band and and make it so that there's just a lot of viable options for people so I felt that was all very interesting uh did you have something else to say about this hat so I was curious, and I looked up what Bro did before Hearthstone, because I agree that I knew that he came from some other game, and that Ixar actually joined Team 5 by hitting, he was the first player ever to hit Rank 1 Legend, and he worked yeah. in Blizzard, um, and so he, he got into the balance team that way, and clearly belonged there, and, uh, and I agree that the balance, uh, like a balanced team designer taking this kind of visible role is obviously a very big shift, but Bro came from the World of Warcraft TCG. So, ah, he, that, there you go. So he was apparently 
one of the founding members of the WoW TCG design team uh, until Team 5 was made and then joined the Hearthstone design team. So he also has years and years of card design experience, but it seems like he was all about initial design or the design as opposed to the the design as opposed to development, which is what Magic would call it, about making the cards as opposed to honing the cards. So he definitely had a different approach there. Did have a lot of card game experience, um, but you know, WoW TCG was a very different beast as well. So it makes sense yeah, it that... Ixar is kind of born and bred by Hearthstone. That is the card game environment that he knows, and he's been working on balancing it for years and years and years. And we'll talk about it a little bit more, but I think this round of Nerf shows, like you were talking about, well, the infamous remark was the soul of the card, right? <laughs> and <laughs> right. they've learned the soul of the card doesn't mean keep the mana cost and the power and toughness the same. It means keep the text of the card the same. All of these cards, except for a small numbers tweak on the Rogue Quest, which has been nerfed twice, and uh, having a number on Dark Pact... They all have basically the same functionality, and I think these are nerfs they would not have made in the same way, either speed or subtlety, a year ago or two years ago, and uh, that also shows a different philosophy. This, these have probably been in the works for a little while, but I think that if they were nerfing under the old philosophy, you know, it's possessed lackey might give all your demons plus one attack, or maybe Shutterwalk would have been nerfed into the ground or said, repeat, you know a random battle cry or something, they might have been either more overreactive or underreactive and only nerfed maybe just Call to Arms or just Possess Lackey, but instead they they took a more nuanced approach that I think, we'll talk about it later, but it might be more even in terms of power level distribution. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Two quick things. I did hit the... <laughs> you were talking about the, uh, the Shutterwalk... Uh, you know, changing the shutter walk, and I know they just changed it to the 20 battle cry cap. I actually hit that yesterday. Oh, Didn't wow. think that was possible. Um, but also, you were talking about High Legend. Did you guys see uh, the Chalky and XR interaction on Twitter? Yes. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> that because you were saying the XR was one of the first to ever hit rank one legend. Well, he's still hitting very high legend. He recently hit uh, rank eight in legend. And then I saw Chalky put together a tweet where he hit rank six legend <laughs> just to one up Ixar. And that interaction was quite hilarious. Well, that was the second funny interaction they had. There was one where Ixar tweeted, I can't seem to win with Q block. Can anyone help me out? And then Chalky tweeted at him, see me in my office. <laughs> Anyway, all right, so let's move on to the next news item we have here. They're having the first official Hearthstone cosplay contest. I think this is pretty sweet. So we have a link in our show notes. You can send a email to this email address in the in the link and uh, of a Hearthstone cosplay, and the winner is going to get a replica... Aluneth staff, as well as a trip to Cologne, Germany for Gamescom 2018. I think this is really sweet. Uh, Cinder, have have you seen seen this uh, this post here? It's on Hearthstone Top Decks. I I learned about it uh, by reading these show notes, and I read <laughs> it. Um, and this this uh, is definitely relevant to my interests. I'm not a huge cosplay person, but my life partner spouse person she is uh she is a cosplay queen and we are already planning out something amazing and uh we're definitely going to go for this i think sweet uh hat i think you put this in the show notes uh, how did you hear about this i heard about it by going to one of my favorite websites hearthstone top decks and scrolling down the news <laughs> section got it okay cool. so unfortunately i don't have much uh connection with this i i am a cosplay appreciator and I will say that at BlizzCon, there was so many cool cosplays that I really enjoyed seeing. Um, but I am not a cosplayer, so curious to see what the designs are. And that replica Alaneth looks badass. Yeah, I'm Evidence, really as always, like getting all the news scoops. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, I will be straight with you, listeners. When I want to know the Hearthstone news for the show notes, I just go to Hearthstone Top Decks and Hearthpone. And just scroll through the list, and anything that's on there, I put it there. And that is pretty much the news preparation process for the week. <laughs> and it gets everything every time. 
Well, the next news item we have that I got just from going to the Hearthstone main site, because that's how I get my news, is uh, we have the top Hearthstone players for April 2018 uh, with a link in there. And I wanted to say congrats to a couple coin concede errs. Uh, Reganus Prime finished number nine on the wild ladder. Holy cow. Uh, I think that's a new high. F- I'm pretty sure that's a new high for him. Uh and then all, we also had Woodford getting 94th, Appa at 101, and Cream Puff at 108. Uh, if you are a coin conceder and I missed you, I do apologize. I tried to go through it quickly and, and remember any names, but definitely hit me up if you were on there too. I'd, I'd love to give you recognition for doing well because getting high ladder finishes is, is quite impressive. True facts. Uh, so the next piece of item... or. The next item I have on here is uh, the second batch of BlizzCon tickets went on sale and sold out instantly, as they tend to do. Uh, But I wanted to give an opportunity for people, if you're looking to buy legitimate uh, BlizzCon tickets and not try to get, you know, get them from scalpers off eBay or anything, there's a website you can go to, lfblizzcon.com. I know that both Hat, I, and... Hat, Appa, and I will will be there, and uh, hopefully we can see some of the listeners there too. I'm real excited about BlizzCon this year. Oh yes, uh, same. We actually just yeah. looked into it as well. Uh, that contest, the cosplay contest, is Europe only. Oh. So if you are in Austria, Belgium, Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Ireland, it- Italy, Latvia, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Malta, Norway, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Czech Republic, Netherlands, or United Kingdom, you may enter. If you are not, then you may observe. Observing will still be pretty cool, I think. I yes. think there's going to be a lot of really great yes. submissions. I expect a lot of great ones. Um Last little item I had on here that I just added because I thought it was pretty funny and I saw it on Reddit last week. I don't know, did either of you play the Tavern Brawl from last week? Yes. Uh, so somebody got 100 wins in the East, or the, sorry, not Easter, the uh, Noble, Noble Garden, Garden Tavern Brawl. <laughs> and oh, I, just ha- I just have to tip my hat to them because Don't that tip had me. To be... I don't want to be tipped. <laughs> I that that brawl was a bit of a chore. I I won't say I didn't enjoy it, but my one and done took quite a while because <laughs> when that the eggs hatched and they they went sleepy, so you didn't get to attack with them right away. So each minion was basically slept for two turns. Uh, so it took a while to actually finish. But I, I I guess this is proof that there's no wrong way to enjoy Hearthstone because there's something for everybody. Yep. Definitely. <laughs> it's the brawl this week is so much more fun though. Last week was uh yeah. the egg brawl. I think what slowed it down for me uh, was that the minions after they hatch can't attack. So it's cuz you got an egg each turn and then you could die it and give it a buff when it hatched and the eggs were uh stealthed and then when they hatched it gave you a minion but it couldn't attack the same turn you got it. So you kind of prepped the egg then turn to hatch you waited until the next turn to actually use the minion that was inside it. So it felt like Basically a really, really small snowball that just took forever to get going. And uh, this week's brawl is much more fun. It is top two, where you take two cards, and your deck is 15 copies of each. And boy, is it fun. Yeah, I like this one a lot. There's a lot of cool combinations. My personal favorite right now is uh, Armor Smith and Warpath, because it beats all of the decks that are not the one that Cinder proposed, which was... Uh, it is Naturalize and Forest's Guide. Um, whenever you, we, Top 2 comes up, my first card is always Naturalize. Like, in, end of story. <laughs> what else makes my opponent draw cards? Because uh, Naturalize is one mana, hard removal, and gives you a win condition all in one card, and you get 15 of them. Why would you never run that every single time? Um, it's I, I tried thinking about how you beat that all day, and it seems pretty difficult to beat. It's not perfect, but, you know, pretty yeah, hard to beat one mana removal. The yeah. only deck I know that would probably be pretty good against it is the Mind Blast, which I've seen 
yeah. quite a bit. But it, it feels like there's kind of a rock, paper, scissors, because obviously my Warpath deck can never be, <laughs> never in a million years be uh, oh. naturalized. <laughs> yeah. I was doing, so I tried Knife Juggler Call to Arms. I will say that I also had the idea, uh, this is a fun deck, not a good deck, a fun deck, of playing a Crystal Core, the Rogue Quest, and Feral Gibber. Because, you know, Feral Gibber, you play it, and then you attack with it, and you get another copy, and you just keep repeating it over and over again. And, of course, you're guaranteed to have the quest on turn one, right? Well, it turns out, guaranteed to have the quest on turn one <laughs> applies to all oh. 15 copies in your deck. <laughs> so after two games in a row, the first game I thought I was unlucky. The second game, I mulliganed a full hand of four quests and got back four quests and then top deck a quest, and I'm like, wait a minute. Yep. So, laughed, conceded turn three, went back and got my pack, and I saw a couple interesting ones, but the first game I played, Cinder, with your deck with uh, Naturalized Forest Guide, my opponent's minion was Blood Mage Thalnos. Oh, did we have oh, fun. No. Oh, did we no. have fun. I was I was a druid, and I did not hero power a single Blood Mage Thalnos. That my naturalized drew three cards that day. Yeah. It was, uh, he, he played it out for two more turns, but his other card was Razor Petal Volley, and he's like, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop now. Stop playing. <laughs> anyway, that's all I had for the news, uh, this week. We will be talking more extensively about the nerfs in the Dexplanation segments this week. Oh, yes. But for now, we actually had some pretty cool tournaments this week and well one tournament this week and then another two coming up so let's talk about them it's the grand tournament. all right i've been practicing my auctioneer voice with a bunch of european countries let's try and get that going for the north america summer playoffs that is the term i call them prelims they're not prelims they are the summer playoffs but you get the idea so the top four that qualified, again, this is a top four, bottom four cut. Either you make it or you don't. So it's kind of a weird double elimination. But the four players that qualified are Reyes from Brazil, Nal Gudan from Argentina, I believe, Dog and yes. Killin' All Day, who are both from North Amer from the USA, over Fibonacci, PNC, Muzzy, and the Jor Dude. You can tell it's a totally loaded top eight. All of those players with extensive competitive history. Um, and then, before we get into the meta, the collegiate top eight champs were announced as well. Those those That tournament didn't happen this past weekend. It happened about three weeks ago, Core cast it. But just wanted to remind everyone that is still going on, the, and the finals are this weekend. So we'll be talking about that in a little bit. Um, but as far as the NA prelims go, there was some high-level Hearthstone. This is a skill-intensive meta. And most of the lineups that did well were the ones that were generally the best decks, but there were some off-the-wall lineups, and there were some really, really high-level play that we'll talk about where players won games that looked completely written off. So Old Guardian, he is a wonderful human being and a keen analyst when it comes to HCT tournaments, and he wrote what is maybe his best article ever about the America Summer Playoffs. It's linked in the show notes, Please go check it out. It's where I got almost all of my statistics on this. And also huge props to our friend Wicked Good, like I talked about last week. He built this interactive deck list and card information dashboard that you should totally check out. If you are a data nerd, this thing will make you ecstatic at how incredible it is. And it's interactive, and you can mess with it and see individual cards and decks and players, and there's a lot going on there. So thanks to both of you gentlemen for the help in getting this report together. So let's look at the meta. We had 43 Q-Blocks, 21 Control Warlocks, and two Zoos. Two lonely Zoos. The second most played class was Rogue. 20 Quest Rogues, 15 Odd Rogues, 2 Miracle Rogues. There were 45 Even Paladins, 9 Murlocs. 48 Spiteful Druids, 10 Taunts, 2 Tokens, 29 Tempo Mages, 2 Big Spell Mages, 26 Mind Blast Priest, and a single Spiteful. And then we get down to, there were 6 Hunters, 4 of them were Spell, 2 were Baku Face, 6 Baku Control Warriors, 2 Recruit, and 3 even Shaman. Shaman, the most underrepresented class, and there were none in the top 8, and no Shutter Walks to be found. Now as far as the top 8, we ended up with 8 out of 8 Warlocks, 5 Cube, 3 Control, 7 out of 8 Druid, 5 Spiteful, 2 Taunt. We had 
five even paladins, four quest rogues, one odd rogue, two Baka control warriors, and one recruit in the top eight, two mind blast priests, and two spell, spell hunters. We actually have the deck list available to us as well from APAC. And we haven't dug into them too far yet. We'll do this full analysis and breakdown next week after we have the top eight to speak about. But I think these statistics really paint a clear picture as to why the meta needs to change. There were 71 players and only 18 archetypes represented. 68 out of 71 players brought Paladin, and every single one was an even Paladin. There were, si there were 68 out of 71 players that brought even Paladin only, and no one considered any other Paladin archetype. There were 48 Druids out of 71 players. Every single one was Spiteful Druid. All of them. It's that kind of pigeonholing of an archetype, and you'll kind of see that as well when we get to talking about the collegiate meta, is an indicator that maybe some balancing needs to happen when there's one clear choice above the rest. So as the collegiate top eight, just to give you an idea of what we'll be expecting, again, these games were played about three weeks ago, but we had five cube warlocks, three control, five spiteful druids, five mind blast priests, four quest rogues, one odd rogue, four even paladins, two big spell mages, we had two odd warriors, and one odd hunter. So we're starting to see the meta kind of sort itself into boxes. And really, if you're not one of the decks that we've already covered here, you probably aren't going to be able to compete on a high level. So these nerfs coming will really open up the door for a lot of new things to happen. Before I get into games to watch, Cinder and Bot, what did you see of these tournaments? Uh, what, what did you see that you want to talk about? Well, I was paying very special attention to uh, Frozen and Fibonacci because they had that recruit warrior in their lineups, and I was really yes. curious to see how that held up. And obviously it held up well because Fibonacci top eight had very, very nearly missed qualifying uh, like a five-game series, which came down to the wire at the very end that he uh, ended up falling out of. Um, but yeah, like I am a, I've discovered recently that, that in, in my heart of hearts, I'm a warrior player. Uh, over even though I've I've you know many times espoused the the my love of Hunter and and I still love it but I am at, at heart I am Garage, uh, and I am tanking up whenever I can. Um, and that Recruit Warrior I tried it out a bunch I even played it on a ladder and it it was about a fifty fifty deck and I had no idea what I was doing, um, and it had quite a lot of potential for power play and combined all of the things that make Warrior viable with all of its board clears and hard removals. Uh, plus, it cheated out minions, and as Chucky once said, and I quote often, cards have to cheat to be good. Uh, if if a card is just okay, it will never see play, uh, or at least will very rarely see play. Um, so I w I watched uh, their games uh, pretty closely, but you know I'm also like super excited about the amount of uh, Latin American representation in this top eight. You have Race now Gliden and PNC, who's also from Argentina. Uh, that's three out of eight of the top eight coming from uh, Latin American countries, and it's been a long time coming. It's a very active scene down there. There are a lot of extremely talented players. Race has long been uh, a fixture of competitive events down there, and he finally gets into the HCT. We've, of course, seen now Goyden and PNC in events before as well. Uh, so I'm super proud to see that part of the world starting to really knock people around and uh, killing all day, man. He has been knocking on the door of HCT for so, so long, and he has finally, finally qualified. So big congrats to him because he's been working his butt off for basically no recognition and no payoff, and it's about time for him as well. I really liked uh, when I was watching Killing All Day play just how stoic he was. Mm -hmm. uh, when whenever something happened, it was he seemed just very focused. I, I, it was a pleasure just kind of watching his mannerisms during that. But I wanted to ask you guys because uh, I guess I didn't pay enough attention after EU playoffs. But how do you guys like the new uh, the way they do the top eight now? It seems considerably better than mm -hmm. how they how they did it before. Yeah, I I like this a lot. Um, the, in the previous years, I, I personally thought it was problematic to continue 
playing out the uh, quarter, semi, and final matches because those uh, those four players have already qualified. The remaining of the the remainder of the series was was basically just exhibition matches, which I wasn't sad to have, but they didn't have anything on the line. There were no stakes involved, so I think the interest level in those matches was very very low. Uh, but I, I do like this group stage uh, system that they've gone to. Uh, it it all of the the matches matter, and you stay really super engaged with the event over the course of the the weekend cast. So I'm I'm a fan. I'm I'm glad they switched to this for the qualifications. I was watching Dog stream after he qualified. I think he made a really valid point about it, though, that you could just change one little minor detail that might make it a bit better, and that's having the winners of the loser bracket switch uh, switch groups. So, mm. so basically what happened is Fibonacci played Killin' All Day and lost, um, and then got put into the loser's bracket, won his won his match to get a chance to play again, and then had to play Killin' all day again, yeah. which just happened to be his, like, completely a counter lineup to him, whereas at least if you switch the switch the groups for that for just those last two matches then you're not locked into a group where you might just have a matchup that you are just extremely unfavored against, and I think it sounded to me like a pretty logical um, way to change it, but I wanted to get your guys' thoughts. Uh, yeah, I, I that makes sense to me. Um, it, it does kind of violate the idea of it being a group, but I don't really, I think that's arbitrary and doesn't super matter. Uh, but that actually does make sense because having watched a lot of these group stage uh, type uh, qualifiers, qualifying rounds, that happens a lot. Uh, where you get a rematch for people who drop into the lower bracket. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I would be okay with that. It probably needs to be tested, uh, but I think it's a good idea. What do you think, Kat? It's, it makes sense. I think that competitive integrity is present either way, and replaying a match that where in a format where your lineups can matter so much, I think giving a player a fair shake, I guess it's, it gives that feeling of more agency in a player's ability to qualify if they cross over and play a different match, right? Because if they play against a lineup that's really bad for them and they, if they know that if they win, they might have to play against it again, it kind of removes that player's agency from the ability to qualify there, right? Like, I wouldn't want that win to be not given, but more favored for one player um, if they get to play against the same opponent twice and they're really favored for them. It's... It's a small tweak, but I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's Dog's a smart guy. And otherwise, not playing out the top four makes a lot of sense to me. There's already so much fatigue in playing this out. I mean, we're talking about up to 10 matches of Hearthstone over the course of the weekend and intense, grueling, long matches where the brain is tuned to full power at all times. Um, I think it's a really simple and easy change to make, and it's not necessary to have the players play out anymore if they're... If the thing that they're fighting for is shared equally among four people, there's no stakes. There's no point in playing it out. So I agree 100% that it's a good change. Now, as far as games to watch, I really don't want to undersell exactly how great of a tournament this was to watch. Um, pretty much every game I saw was interesting and fun. The casting was great, almost universally. And in particular, I don't know what Kibler did this weekend, but he was on fire. Every cast he did this weekend was particularly, it, it stood out in humor and understanding of the game. And he really seemed engaged with what was going on. Uh, he usually is. But for him to be, when he casted Dog versus Muzzy in game three with uh, Muzzy was playing the mid-range Taunty Token Druid, Kibler spotted his lethal with Savage Roar, Savage Roar branching paths a turn and a half early. And it ended up being the play. And so that kind of insight was really fun to watch. But as far as matches that really stood out to watch, Dog versus Muzzy Game 1, Even Paladin versus Control Mind Blast Priest, you kind of get here a master class on discipline, long-term game planning, and playing the outs under pressure. Dog had an even board with Muzzy being Even Paladin, having a handful of cards, as even Paladin always seems to, and Dog was playing Control Priest, probably had about the same amount of cards, and he had a couple of minions down, 
a primordial drake and i think some random other minion it was a end up being a 3-3 um and the board is relatively even muzzy had a few more minions and dog alex straza's muzzy's face an offensive alex straza on an even board just saying i need to set up this out even though you're going to keep pressure on me and muzzy wore him down and wore him down and wore him down but dog got the anduin and dog set up for the top deck where if he got the mind blast he was going to win and set himself up for the perfect kill. So it was a really impressive turnaround of a game, and it's definitely recommended if you want to see how far into the future the pros are kind of planning for. Now there's another series I want to talk about, and that's the entire five-game series of Fibonacci versus PNC. Now, Mm -hmm. it's, oh my god, this series was so good. And, Cinder, did you watch it? I did. Oh, Um, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it was really good. I, I'm I'm a Pante fan for sure. I am a Fibonacci fan, at least in the Warrior field. He's a bit of a bit of a salty dog uh, on Twitter, uh, but I love seeing him play. I mean, we 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 were talking about the the unique uh, archetypes. We we saw what 17 or 18 unique archetypes. Two of them were there because Fibonacci brought them. Yeah. Uh, that being the Hunter and the Recruit Warrior. So he's he's a super creative guy. Always thinking out of the box. So I, I love watching him play. And Pay and Say is is an operator, uh, so watching these two giants fight was quite quite the match. It was really impressive watching them go back and forth. And the thing about pro level play is that the way they set up these games is so different in the early and mid game. They often wind up in game states that that you never really see on the ladder because you don't get this kind of level of competition. So this series was very tight, but PNC's quest row got swept and fibonacci was playing hunter control warrior and control priest and quest row couldn't win a game and i know hunter (laughs) seems easy it was spell hunter but isn't that absurd it's just yeah it's absolutely absurd now this was that is absurd (laughs) it was recruit warrior so the so pnc in game one his valineer hit a serenite chain gang against control warrior so we all know how that goes Valineer on Chain Gang against a deck that's all about generating value through removal is gonna, there's gonna be some problems there. And from there, the pressure kind of snowballed and PNC was able to, to take that game. But game two, it was a Quest Rogue versus Recruit Warrior. And Fibonacci was like, well, I guess I'll play a Blood Razor and attack on turn four, coin out, gather your party on turn five, and I guess I'll proc this Grom. By the way, you take 12. Two turns later, the game was over. Wow. Yep. He basically said, if you don't have Vanish, I'm going to win this game because there's no removal in that Quest Rogue deck. And that that was the correct way to play. Uh, I mean, it, it obviously it required some luck because that, that Recruit Warrior deck only has five minions. Uh, so it's dep- minus what's in, in hand. Uh, you know, it's it's a one in X, you know, and one in five being the, the least... The, the, high, the, the smallest fraction there. So it's it's not very likely that you'll get the card you need, but he got it. I mean, of course, he probably would have done just as well with um, if he had pulled out the Lich King or, or Ysera or something. But, uh, Maybe even yeah. Rot Face. <laughs> yeah, even yeah. Rot Face. Would have Maybe a Rot Face. It's, there, was, there was a lot going on there, but to watch the Warrior win in such convincing fashion was startling. Uh, Spiteful Druid came back to beat... The spell hunter on uh, on game three, but game four, spell hunter versus quest rogue. Now, spell hunter is not necessarily the fastest deck in the world, right? It's mm. it's got some pressure, but it's not the fastest deck in the world. So it got to the point where PNC was in a low life total, and Fibonacci got vanished, but had his opponent on the ropes, and the crystal core had been played. So Fibonacci's game plan became: don't play a minion for the next four turns. Because that way my opponent can never play Vicious Scalehide to gain life. And he ended up finishing off the game after four turns of not playing a minion that he had in hand and just applying pressure to the face and that being enough. And, and again, just his read of the situation was impressive. But game five was the story of the anemic beatdown squad, the control priest getting the quest rogue to 12 life by turn six. Just by attacking wow. with wild pyromancers and yeah, right. gluttonous oozes it's the anemic beatdown squad is what kibler called it and 
again, Fib played around Vicious Galehide very well and ended up winning by, he put his opponent to four life and basically said, uh, no, two life, basically said I have two turns, maybe three, to draw either Holy Fire, Mind Blast, or Shadow Visions. And on the very last turn, that Holy Fire came up. So, Control Warrior, Control Priest, and Spell Hunter sweeping Quest Rogue is unbelievable. And really, this whole series just deserves your attention. I would definitely recommend checking it out if you want to see a demonstration of unconventional lines of play and winning in unfavorable matchups. It was super cool to watch. (sighs) Man, I want to go back and watch it again. No, I want to go play Hearthstone. But... (laughs) <laughs> Before we do that, why don't we talk about the most important topic of the week, good old nerfs. Before we get there, no thank yous this week, no reviews on iTunes, but just wanted to point out, again, if you leave a review this month, you are entered in a raffle for a free coaching session, which is normally a $10 benefit. Drop us a review. It really helps other people find us on, uh, on iTunes. Okay, the explanations. Here we go. So this week, uh, well, actually just yesterday, the nerf patch was posted, and the first thing Hat says in our in our little Discord was, well, I guess we have explanations for the week. <laughs> uh, so this week, I figured, you know, we'll just talk about each of the nerfs uh, one by one individually, kind of get everybody's take on it and how we think it's going to affect the meta going forward and kind of whether we think that this was the right direction to go with with each of the nerfs. So I guess we'll just start at the top. I think this is, uh, I, I don't know if this is the most important one, but this was, this was the one I think that was needed the most out of all of these. Um, even though it doesn't necessarily affect the format that we play the most, which is Naga Sea Witch going from five mana up to eight mana. That's a little big increase. They did not, <laughs> the, it, listening to or i guess reading the article it was very clear that they kind of like the whole idea of naga sea witch being able to create these giant board states uh all in one turn and uh they just really wanted people to have more time to be able to set up and prepare for something like this so what do you guys think of this hat you said you've been playing a lot of wild uh this month since you hit legend so early so so what do you think here first of all this is the only card in this list that i am immediately dusting the only one um second i think it is fascinating and worth digging into that they didn't just revert the giant costing thing, right? They didn't make Naga Sea Witch say, your minions cost five, I mean it this time. Or they didn't get rid of the change they made, I think it was about six months ago, where they said that these cost reduction effects occur after any cost reduction effects in the text of the card. Because it used to be that the giants were reduced in cost and then cost five. And now it's they cost five and then you reduce the cost. Yeah. So, they're clearly trying to set up some kind of consistency with the game rules, which I'm a big, big fan of. And that means that this was a necessary casualty of the standardization of the rules. And I think that's a really interesting decision, and a good one for the long-term health of the game, that they'd rather have the rules work the same every time, and that means that future cost reduction will work this way as well. And it's in a way that makes sense in that you set cost and then you reduce it, right? Because reducing and then setting is kind of counterintuitive. So the the way the layering works is that you set a cost when it says to set a cost and then you reduce it. It's like you set health and then you can increase it or decrease it, but it doesn't override it like it does in play. It just, it works together. So they're saying this costing thing and this consistency of the rules is more important for us than, than it is for us to create a corner case with how this card works, or to revert the change. We think the change to the rules is more important than this card still existing in a really playable way. And at 8 mana, 8 mana summons a 5-5 five, five, and 4 giants is still worth 8 mana. But it's very different, and it's not a hard speed check on the format anymore. And I think hard speed checks of that type 
All right, this was this was spiteful stum- summoner on steroids. You either had to have pressure by turn five, significant enough pressure to win by turn six, or you couldn't compete with this deck. It was quest rogue to end all quest rogues, or summoner to end all summoners, because in standard, you know, summoner, if you didn't have a removal spell or they roll Tyrantus, then yeah, you might be dead that game, but you might have an answer, you might have a bunch of taunts. This was really unstoppable if you were unfavored against it, and extremely stoppable if you were favored by just going face. So, I I like they got rid of the hard speed check in the format. I think that's unhealthy for any format to have. Eight mana is a lot. And I'm surprised, I think pleasantly, that they didn't change the text or the effect of the card in order to maintain consistency of the rules. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Do you have anything to add, Cinder? Uh, I I have very, very little awareness of, of the wild format. I know only of Naga Sea Witch plus Giants in story. Uh, it is a legend told by uh, the neighboring tribes. And we when we do our culture, cultural exchange <laughs> once a year, uh, they retell these stories of terror. Uh, but yeah, I don't really have a perspective on this. I'll probably plug into like into the wilds this week and kind of get their their deep dive on it to get an idea. That sounds like a good thing. Yeah. Well, well I know. And I've played a bunch of wild. I haven't seen Giants Warlock. Like, it's just not something I've run into. Now, I'm only hovering around rank four, but I haven't seen a single one. I have a feeling it's a deck that a lot of people played because it was so good, but now that they know that it's not going to be viable anymore, they don't feel like they have to play it because of its power level, if that makes any sense. But either way, this next card... I'm going to have to talk about, and it just so happens that we have Cinder here. And if I'm remembering correctly, I do believe Cinder was in chat when we were reviewing this card when it was first uh, kind of announced. And I believe Cinder was saying it was bonkers, insane, or something along those lines. Uh, That's pretty good. And I, uh, I was not super excited about it. The card is called Arms. And Call to Arms is now going from 4 mana to 5 mana. And just a quick reminder that I did not (laughs) properly evaluate this card. This card uh, definitely needed a change. I wasn't sure what that change needed to be. Now that I've seen this change and this is what's going forward, I'm fine with it. Um, I don't really know how else they could have changed this card to make it... um, the power level they're looking for, but uh, I feel like even Paladin obviously loses its best card, and I think that it's still possible that even Paladin can still be a thing. There are a few different ways I feel like you can take it. Plus, the shell obviously just has to be good enough to win anyway because you don't draw Call to Arms every single game, and that deck's obviously still winning a lot. So, um, Cinder, what what's your take on on this change here? So I, I think it's correct, just in on a in a vacuum. Um, I, I'm trying to find my old notes on it, but but yeah, I do recall saying that thin your deck, play three minions that cost up to six for four mana out of one card is really good, and it is in fact really good. Um, pushing it to five, I definitely think pushes it towards fair, uh, but as far as the the effect it's going to have on the game, even Paladin is basically over. Um, I don't think it's going to maintain the power level uh, to compete with other Paladin builds uh, to remain a, a force in the meta. Uh, however, I think that Murloc Paladin is just as good and has almost the same matchup spread that even Paladin has now. And having Call to Arms be at five mana for that deck is actually really natural for for it because of the uh, gentle Megasaur on four. So I I think it's, it's not going to really change Paladin as far as being a force in the meta because Murloc Paladin is just going to jump right in its place as the uh, aggressive Paladin build. Uh, But I do think the card, the card change in a vacuum, I think is, is correct. I, I like the five mana. Yeah. I think just delaying it a little bit, giving the, uh, giving some decks just a little more time to kind of develop their board so that uh, when the call to arms comes out, it's not so backbreaking, yeah. um, I think is pretty good. Yeah, do you have anything else to add there, Hat? On I this think card? that saying even Paladin's going to die is in no way correct. 
Because here's the thing. Here's what I've realized. I actually discovered this in a Twitter conversation yesterday with uh, Hockey Boys 3. He's a good friend of mine. Um, right now, you can play Paladin with every mana cost available in your deck. Or you can take out half those cards and replace that with a one mana hero power. And the one mana hero power is better than all of those odd cards. Then just playing regular old aggro Paladin is worse than taking out half of the cards available to you to guarantee you can get that free one mana 1-1 one, one every turn. And that's pretty telling. That the hero power is so improved that it's worth playing over half the available cards to your class. Now, losing Call to Arms is going to be an enormous blow, obviously, because it's the best card in the deck and it's not even close. You still have tools available to you. It might be worth going back to Aggro oh, Paladin. It's close. Well, it's... But only close to Terum. Okay, and, then every... and then a huge <laughs> drop-off from there. Okay, only close to this other card that was on the verge of being nerfed. Understood, I agree. <laughs> um, but it's if it's currently worth it to play Aggro Paladin without half of the Aggro Paladin cards, I don't think that's going to change. It's going to be worse but I don't think it will be unplayable. It might be Tier 2, it might be Tier 3, it might be not worth playing over Odd Paladin, which is still fine, or regular old Aggro Paladin, or Murloc, which is still, per Vicious Syndicate's number, is one of the best decks in the format as well. It's, I think, number 1 or number 2, right ahead of Q-Block. Uh, Murloc will still see a ton of play, and it's totally worth playing, and Call to Arms at 5 is great in that deck. Though note, don't put Call to Arms in your Odd Paladin deck. It only gets 1-drops. No. No. Don't play that. Just want to make sure we're clear. But I think that even Paladin will still exist. It may not be as good, but the hero power is just so strong. Yeah, I I mean, don't get me wrong. I think even Paladin is, is still going to be playable. I, I just think it will be immediately replaced in the meta by Murloc Paladin because the decks are so, so similar. And Call to Arms continues to function for Murlocs where it won't anymore for uh, even Paladin. And that's an important distinction. Yep, that's fair. Yeah, I like I like all all of the points you both just made, but let's move on to the next card. Which oh well, actually before we move on, because we did touch on it br very briefly, is Terum. Do you guys have any opinions on whether you think Terum should have gotten a little bit of a re reduction? I'm kind of feeling like my suggestion of making it a three six would have been good, but also in line not in line with what it seems like Team Fives. Uh, ideas on how to nerf cards works out because I know they were saying they didn't want to change the numbers on War Axe, which is why they increased the mana cost because it's a much more obvious nerf to it and they don't want to change cards like Tarim just by moving those numbers around a little bit because it's not as obvious to people who aren't as tuned into the meta as people like us are. The the infamous soul of the card. Yes, soul uh, of the card. Were, remember from a Warsong Commander nerf. Um, I honestly, there, Terum is is an is an amazing card, but there are plenty of game states where Terum is unplayable, uh, and and I think that's telltale. There there is never a time where you don't want to play Call to Arms unless there's just a you know a stronger play than Call to Arms. It doesn't happen often, but sometimes it does exist. Uh, but there are times where you can't play Tarim because of the specific board state. And I think that's probably what keeps Tarim from uh, being put on the block. Uh, I, th I think he's okay as he is now. That may change. You know, if, if a more t token uh, oriented paladin comes down the line, I could see Tarim uh, being revisited. But for now, I think he's okay. I think I would tweak what you said about Call Arms just slightly in that it's it's always probably the most powerful play, but sometimes you don't want to make the most powerful play into mm. a board clear. True. So you hold off on Call to Arms to actually purposefully make a weaker play so that Call to Arms after your board gets wiped is stronger. Yeah, it's a strong refill mechanic. Right. So if you already have a board, it's you know you just continue to, to apply pressure and wait for a board clear. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, a stronger Divine that, Favor, uh, and I have very strong feelings about Divine Favor. That <laughs> I won't repeat here because this is a family podcast, but um, I think good cards need to be allowed to exist in Standard. And these nerfs make sense, but good cards can still exist. And Tarim is a good card, a very, very good card, but still can exist in Standard. And I think if you look at the five Standard cards that were nerfed, every single one is about reducing the consistency that these cards create. 
Call to Arms, Possess Lackey, Dark Pack, Spiteful Summoner, and Quest Rogue all create consistent game plans and alter the construction of your deck in a really particular way to achieve the same desired outcome every single game. Call to Arms, you put it in your deck, and you maximize your two drops to the point where even Paladin is better because Call to Arms exists, and this might be the best argument sender that one could make against even Paladin's continued existence, is that it's better than regular Paladin because you guarantee Call to Arms only hits two drops. Possess yeah, Lackey, every single deck it goes in, you're guaranteeing it's only hitting Void Lord. And you play Dark Pack to make that happen more frequently early. Spiteful Summoner, you're guaranteeing a free 10 mana minion by turn 6, if not sooner. And Quest Rogue, well, we know what that's guaranteeing. You're dead in the face from Stone Tusk Borer on turn 9. So all of these nerfs are about slowing down consistent game state effects and punishing cards that reward you for building your deck to get the same outcome every time because when the same outcome happens too quickly well remember spreading plague on five remember ultimate infestation on six with those innervates remember any time that we have a card that enables the same thing happening every single game then it, it needs to get taken out of the game because usually when that happens too fast it's problematic and so that's why i think we've seen nerfs in the past uh small time buccaneer was one that came to mind because whenever that guy came down on one, you just built decks to get him on one and reward him. And it was very powerful. Um, a few other nerfs that we've seen are all about just reducing the consistency of these effects, but no one was talking about Keliseth, right? Because Keliseth, you distort your deck a little bit, and it's still probably in the high end of power level. I'm not sure I'd call it a mistake, but I'd call it, in, you know, really, really strong. But there's a lot of variance involved in that card draw mechanic. There's a lot of variance about when you get it, and sometimes it pays off, and other times you have no two-drop because your deck doesn't play it and you have no Kalisath. So I think there's a lot of middle ground there, but these nerfs are all about reducing the consistency of decks um, that did the same thing every game in a way that was oppressive to the rest of the format. And I think that's why the nerfs are so elegant, and that's why it makes sense they're hitting so many recruit cards because that was what that mechanic was all about. And I think if you want to hear more about this, you put together a really good thread on Twitter. So you, if you aren't following Ridiculous Hat on Twitter, I don't know what you're doing, but you definitely should. And go check out a thread he put together about deck restrictions and how careful we have to be about in the future. Well, uh, how careful Team 5 should be in the future about these deck restriction cards and uh, kind of what the future of Hearthstone looks like uh, if we continue along this path. Um, but Cinder, I wanted to I wanted to ask you about Possessed Lackey going from mm. five to six mana. I know that Hat just kind of covered a, a lot of these cards, um, but what what do you think about Cube Lock going forward, or just Control Lock and Possessed Lackey decks in general? Do you think this is enough of a change to to affect uh, its meta representation going forward? Uh, I, I do want to rewind really, really quickly. We okay. talked about Tarim. Appa's not here, and I feel like it's necessary for someone to to step in for Appa and say that he called it. Uh, and, yeah, there you go. Um, possess Lackey 6 mana, and it's almost impossible to talk about Possess Lackey without also talking about Dark Pact, uh, mm -hmm. moving to 4 health instead of 8, because these two cards are part of a pair, right? This is a combo. It's the, the, it's the defining combo of Q-Block. Uh, this is this is what gets you to cheat out those charging five sevens, um, and moving it from five to six really means that the combo is not available until turn seven or later. And I think that's a pretty important uh, pace adjustment to the to the game. But I don't think it's enough to keep Q block out of out of the picture. What it's going to do is it's going to make Q block more susceptible to aggressive strategies and give those those kind of decks a turn more. Uh, to get ahead of them, because uh, the, one of the things that Q-Block is so good at is clearing the board, right? You've got Defile on two, Hellfire on four, but now your demon summoning, your demon recruiting doesn't happen until turn seven, maybe coin six. Uh, and that, that it puts a turn of gap uh, between turn four, where you might refill after a Hellfire or you know a, a Defile combo, and then turn five, where Warlock has to come up with an answer for a refill. And I, I think that's a big deal. And I think that's going to give space for aggressive strategies to start to shine. Uh, so it's a good change. But I don't think it takes Q-Block and, to a lesser extent, Control Lock out of the meta. It's still a very powerful combo. And there's a 
there's plenty of support for it between cubes and spirit singer umbra and tal Duran and rat catchers if you're on the rat catcher train and dark possession is, a, is still a possibility uh with skull combinations to trigger the lackey so there's all kind of stuff that can still happen in that deck and it's it has a lot of overlapping synergies combo synergies that all work together so i don't think that this change invalidates those combos it just slows the deck down hopefully enough for uh a just aggress just beating the deck down uh before those combos come out yeah i think those are all all really good points and the addition in addition i was just act, this just came to me i think this actually is a pretty big nerf to mountain giant in the warlock decks mm. because one of the big things with dark pack restoring eight health is that it felt like you could there were a lot of situations where you could just kind of with reckless abandon tap on two and three and not yeah. really have to worry about taking that life total damage because you're going to recoup it all back with the dark pack. So dark pack going from eight health down to four means that maybe it's not as reliable to be able to do the, do the tapping on turn two and three, and we might see an uptick in the more controlling version of of the deck that's trying to play like Stonehill, Defender, and, and Tar Creepers maybe on turn three um, to kind of prevent as much life loss in the early game. I don't know if that... I, I think that makes... or uh, It makes sense to me. It also... Um, in the sense that it also makes your mage matchup even worse <laughs> because it felt like the only way you ever won against the aggressive mage decks is by actually getting a dark pact to not get counterspelled. Um, so I think it kind of reduces its matchups that it already wasn't great against, but still maintains uh, a lot of the power that it had, obviously. So... It'll be interesting to see. I know, Hat, you you said you were learning some Q block, and by the by the gist of what you were saying earlier, it didn't seem like you were thinking this would still be as much of a thing going forward. How do you think this really affects it? So, you can still play what the deck is trying to do, but the deck was already somewhat vulnerable to early strategies. Something I learned by playing Q block instead of losing to Q block is that it's very easy to lose while playing as Q-Block. It is very, very easy to lose with it. It doesn't just go off every time. And you really have to work on building these, these combo-friendly board states and then iterating them, but it doesn't always just happen. Like, half of the time that I played the Skull, it got oozed, if not more. Bot was actually telling me on stream against Paladin, you don't even keep Skull anymore because it just dies. So... Mm -hmm. If we're not going to have Lackey around until turn six, and I still expect to see a heavy silence meta, I don't know if the deck can survive in an aggro-heavy field as built. I do think that Control Warlock makes a lot more sense, a long-term game plan. And you can still play Skull. And maybe you even fit in some of these cube pieces, but it has to be Control Warlock with a couple combo pieces grafted on, as opposed to a full-on combo deck like it is now, because... Right now, the volume of life gain you have is really, really crazy. And cutting the dark packs in half and reducing the eight possible total life gain you're going to get over the course of the entire game and slowing down that Void Lord, I think makes it very easy for a lot of aggressive decks just to push you over in a way that you were less vulnerable to before. And one thing this really helps Paladin is that weapons are so much more likely to connect now. And an extra couple weapon hits, that's a lot of damage. If it's True Silver or Valineer, that's an extra 8 damage you weren't taking before because there was a Void Daddy in the way. So I, I think there's something to be said for Control Warlock still existing. I think Lackey will probably still see play because it's still a tutor and a mana cheat. But I'm not sure that Q-Block in its current form is going to survive as we know it. There will probably still be some kind of Doom Guardy combo we sort of thing, but it's going to need to change and grow and evolve in order to stay relevant, and boy, that Tempo Mage matchup is going to be rough. Yeah. It's going to suck. I mean, 
a lot of the Warlocks were already starting to play Shroom Brewer, I think largely due to the Mind Blast Priest becoming more popular and just getting, like, geisted. But e even still, like, they're already looking for more life gain, so taking away a bit, uh, quite a bit of, of their life gain is, uh, I think you're going to feel it a lot. Um, let's get into the next card. Spiteful Summoner, six mana to seven mana. Um... I, I was try I'm trying to conceptualize this a lot in my head because I like to think about the turn at which cards come down and how it lines up with the rest of the format. So I think this is actually a pretty good change. I like this this quite a bit. I think you have to rethink the spiteful deck a lot because now your six drop slot is just kind of empty and I don't know how you fill that void or if you even need to fill that void. But just the way that things used to line up with, uh, oh man, Greedy Sprite and getting out the Spiteful Summoner a turn earlier, I think overall this just allows decks to have what they're, what Team 5 was looking to have happen, which is just more time to prepare for that Spiteful Summoner turn. I do think this deck is still quite viable. I think it's still quite powerful. But just giving a little more time to the other decks in the format, I think, um, will be a good good change. Uh, what, what do you think for, for the Cinder? It's, it's, it's interesting trying to, to look into the Crystal Ball and see what this is going to do to Spiteful builds, because... It, when when Bone Mare went from seven to eight mana, most people said, "Oh, it's still fine. It's still perfectly playable on eight. Guess what? Bone Mare is gone. It has not seen constructed play since that change. So, it, while I feel like going from six to seven mana does not change the fact that this card is at minimum a twelve twelve the turn you play it, which is still really good for seven mana and it's two bodies. Uh, I I don't really know that that that's true. It it may change you know just the texture of the mana curve so much uh, that it that it makes it inviable. And I think one of the big things that that pop that jumps out to me is that uh, Anduin is now an immediate turn after response to a spiteful play, whereas before uh, Anduin could not be played for a turn uh, between six and eight. So now going from seven to eight, immediate answer available for priests, which is kind of the one of the classes that has the hardest time dealing with that you have to run shadow word death just to to deal with the spiteful uh, builds it's the only way that the, the deck stays viable uh so i think that's an interesting point too uh but we'll, we'll just gonna have to see i think we have to see how it plays out i think uh spiteful builds will depopulate for a time and just will just depend on whether or not uh the meta recovers and, and brings it back I mean, if you look at what Hat was saying earlier about APAC, is that there's a lot of Spiteful Summoner, and mm -hmm. everybody's only bringing Spiteful Summoner, so maybe this gives an opportunity for a different Druid deck to uh, to take its place. Uh, what, what do you think, Hat? Druid is quietly the second best class on the ladder right now. It is better than Warlock in terms of pure win rate. And part of that is Spiteful, a big part. But if we look at the other nerfs that are coming, one of the big winners is the Druid class because Togwaggle Druid, don't sleep on it, it's an actual deck. Taunt Druid, actual deck, pretty good. I know it didn't have much tournament performance lately, but I it's still a perfectly relevant archetype. And Spiteful kind of prevents as much ingenuity that you can have in a Druid build. Because if you're putting in Spiteful, you're taking out everything, and you're putting in UIs, and lots of minions, and that's your deck. So there's different ways you can configure it, but you just don't get to play with all of these cool druid spells. And I think there's a lot of really good druid spells and a disgusting amount of armor gain in current standard. When I was playing Taunt Druid the Legend, what I noticed against Tempo Mage is that they could never keep up with the volume of armor I was generating... And Control Warlock couldn't keep up with the amount of value I was generating, even when they rinned me, because they would go, they would play Azari, and then I would play four more Hadronoxes. Like, I don't care if you destroy my deck, I have everything I need to beat you. So, mm -hmm. I think Druid will be a big winner, but I think it will be at the expense of Spiteful Druid. I think the deck will still exist. And none of these nerfs seem to be completely class eliminating, or deck eliminating, at least so far at first blush, but they might be, because one mana nerfs. Call of the Wild, 
that nerf for one mana eliminated Hunter as a class. Hunter just went away for a while because Call of the Wild was holding it together. And seven mana is dangerously close to the mana cost where you would just rather play the minion as opposed to play a card that gets the minion and compromise everything in your deck. And the fact that that's a close choice I think is better for the game, but obviously worse for the Spiteful Archetype. And you're playing into the Twisting Nether turn, the Lord Godfrey turn, the Psychic Scream turn, and the Anduin turn. A lot of the turns you're playing into, or you're even playing into Hero Power Tarim. There's so many different turns that you play into now that you didn't before when you were just a little bit faster, that it's much more vulnerable and much less oppressive when it happens on time. And that means the nerf absolutely needed to happen. And if the card was only being played because it was oppressive on time, then I think that the card goes away. But Spiteful, we saw a bunch of Spitefuls on turn 8 and turn 9, and they were fine. The second Spiteful is still good. And what I think this will do is just make Spiteful Druid a lot more fair because it was pretty busted when you were curving Spiteful into Malfurion into Grand Archivist, and now you can't make that same curve anymore. Yep. Totally agree. So the last uh, little nerf here is Quest Rogue. Your minions are no longer going to be 5-5s. Five they will be 4-4s. Four this was actually the change that I proposed back when it was still only four minions to complete the quest. Uh, I think if you really take time and think about all of... Think about the format and how the... Um, the big decks that this that Quest Rogue preys on can can combat it. It's actually a huge change. Like just the way that a four four lines up in the format versus the minions is just a huge deal. Like if you look at Void Lord, now you have to attack a Void Lord three times, and your minions only have one health left, which those Void Walkers that get left over are ripe to trade into. Hellfire Defile now clears it instead of essentially doing nothing. Um, Flame Strike now can clear a board of four fours. Um, and then Primordial Drake now eats two of the minions instead of just, um, ju you know, just running, being able to run in and keep keep your minions. Which a lot of it does feel like sometimes the quest rogue can't you can run them out of resources if your cards line up well enough. And so I think that by making them four fours, it'll give some control decks a fighting chance against. Um, against the deck so uh i don't love the change because i love quest rogue so much but i think it was probably necessary it's definitely going to mean that the quest rogue player will have to play uh play more optimally to be able to conserve its resources because uh i feel like some of the control decks could eventually kind of run you out of them if they're only four fours also just the fact that you can't burst somebody from uh from a higher life total like reducing the amount of damage you take from chargers is is a big change so um it'll be interesting to see if the if the deck stays viable um i don't know i how you've played a ton of quest rogue what what do you think about this change polarizing decks are going to have polarizing opinions right and this was a very polarized deck like it's it was built as a control killer that was all it did and it did so in an impressive way but i think kibler has always maintained that the problem with quest rogue is there is only one way to ever interact with it and that's go face and going face works and you can find unique and interesting ways as fibonacci has proven to us to go face but that's how you kill it and if you don't you will lose to it it will happen every time. The change, I think, is elegant in that it still exists as a counter to super hard control lineups, and I think it's actually pretty cool that it beats Priests now, still. Like, it doesn't get worse against Priest because Anduin no longer wipes the board, but needing eight chargers instead of six to kill someone, I think it's just a better gameplay experience. You're so much less likely to die from 30 in one turn, and that was always super frustrating to experience. Um, I don't know. Other combo decks will rise up, a combo deck needs to exist. I don't need it to be this combo deck. I liked it while it was around. I do think this change will probably get rid of it from ladder. We might see it in the most specific of tournament lineups, but I don't foresee this archetype surviving on the ladder as it stands because 
it was already so unfavored against aggro, and now against control, it's it doesn't punch through a primordial drake without two minions dying. It's there's too many ways to slow it down. Tar Creeper is too good against it. There's too many ways to run it out of resources, which happened more frequently than I think people remembered. Yeah, I think that if you're a quest rogue player and you don't play it very carefully, it you can get run out of resources. And especially if your minions are going to be 4-4s, four um, that seems like something that could very easily happen. Uh but Cinder, it seems like you think that it might have a op an option in like a tournament lineup. Do you think that that still might be viable? Yeah, I, I think so. I, it's it is essentially a you know a, a combo deck with uh, like as we've been saying, very little interaction with uh, with aggro decks, but also generates quite a lot of threat you know immediately from the hand, which control decks hate. Uh, so I, I still think it has potential there, but. You, one thing to keep in mind, and I, you touched on it, uh, but that that four health stat line lines up with a lot of different uh, card effects. Flame Strike is the first one that comes to mind. Dragon's Fury uh, now more effectively clears it in case it hits a polymorph. Uh, there's a number of spells that that break it four instead of five, and of course, value trading is no longer as powerful for the deck. You can't value trade into a four five anymore. Now the deck can only trade into four four or uh, three fours or lower, uh, and that severely limits or or at least reduces the the power the the board impact uh, that the deck has after it completes the quest. Uh, so I, I I do think it's still going to have some lineup potential, but yeah, I I agree with Chad. I don't know that it's going to stay on the ladder uh, after this change. Fair enough. Well, I think that's uh, all I had. That's all I had for uh, for the nerfs. I will be interested to see how this affects tournament lineups. I'm going to have to start prepping a last hero standing lineup um, for Dreamhack Austin coming up. So it'll be it'll be a, a crazy new world. <laughs> yeah. With uh, with these new decks, I'm going to have to think of. Uh, of how to best approach this this new format since it's going to be so fresh um it's going to be hard to tell if people are going to just try to play the same same decks with just slightly worse cards or if people are going to come out with completely new new decks if if slowing down these high tier meta decks brings up some, a, a deck like spell hunter or mind blast priest or shutterwalk shaman into uh into tier one we'll kind of have to see well, I, you know, let's let me pitch that uh, to you to you both. Um, meta predictions: wh who who's going to win from from these changes? What's your opinion on that? Control first, Mage really jumps out to me. It's so mm -hmm. any deck that didn't rely on winning through pressure benefits from a quest rogue nerf in a really major way, and the spiteful druid nerf as well. What Control lost to was too much pressure, too much refill too fast, like Call to Arms. Um, too much combo potential too fast, like Lackey Pact. Too much pressure over time, like too many minions. Now, the Spiteful nerf doesn't reduce the total volume of minions, but it, it reduces the pace, so there's more setup time, so that maybe the big spell mage can save that Blizzard a little longer. And then the nerf to Quest Rogue is obviously a big benefit to all Control decks, especially when Flame Strike now wipes their entire board. So... I think Big Spell Mage, possibly Taunt Druid, are really big benefit uh, benefactors. Really, um, Druid in general benefits here because there's so many really cool controllish or mid-range style Druids that couldn't keep up with Paladin. I think that Muzzy's mid-range or token Druid definitely benefits here. Odro is a big beneficiary because all of its bad matchups got nerfed. Spell Hunter, and I think Hunter in general, has a lot of opportunity here. Really, any mid-range deck. Any deck that couldn't compete between the pincer trifecta of Call to Arms, Fast Void Lords, and, uh, and Quest Rogue. Anything that was crushed by those three things will get some room to grow. Even Shaman. Even Shaman's definitely a winner here, unless there's a really big jump in control decks. Uh, I'm just gonna say Shutterwalk Shaman, my version of it, because 
that's I want it to be good. And I think a lot of people's first uh, impression was Mind Blast Priest gets a lot better, and I really like my matchup against Mind Blast Priest, so that's what I'm going with. <laughs> and I I think I agree uh, with with Hat on on where he's going with it. Uh, with with the amount of best of fives I'm doing every week, I'm doing 20 or so lineup studies every week uh, for myself, my teammates, and our opponents. And one of the things that I do as part of that study is see, okay, if a ban strategy is, you know, one of the first things you do. So what deck do I want to ban based on what I think my opponent might bring? And when you remove the ban deck from the matrix the matchup matrix, it gives you an idea of how much better or worse decks get uh, across an expected field. So if I were to, to apply that same logic and say, what happens if you remove Spiteful Druid, even Paladin, Spiteful Priest, since that's also affected, Cuban Control Warlock, uh, what decks seem to benefit the most across their matchup spread? And the ones that jump out are Taunt Druid, Big Spell Mage, and... Control Warrior, which I'm super, super excited about because uh, 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 Quest Rogue's best matchup was against Control Warrior. Uh, so now that's not going to be the case any longer. And its second best was Big Spell Mage. And uh, Big Spell Mage beats the stuffing out of Taunt Druid because Polymorph uh, skunks uh, Witching Hour. So I'm super, super interested to see where this goes. I am a huge Big Spell Mage fan. I have a golden Atlanta. I am ready to bust her out on ladder. It's going to be a good time, I think. So when you say control Hex. warrior, do you mean taunt or odd or recruit or even or other? So those decks, all of those decks have fairly similar matchup spreads. There are a few key differences, like uh, the quest variants do better against priests than the, the, the pure control variants uh, because of Ragnaros, stuff like that. Um, but they all kind of basically are weak to the same stuff. Like they're all weak to control to, to quest rogue. They're all weak to spiteful stuff. That doesn't change. So I, I think they're all going to be beneficiaries of this of of these changes. Uh, but specifically, decks that run Baku uh, jump out at me because they also have good matchups against Tempo Mage and other burn focused decks. Uh, whereas the non Baku controlled decks or warrior decks don't have that advantage. They usually are unfavored against Tempo Mage. Uh, so I, I think it's going to be specifically the Baku builds. Oh man, we could play Baku Spiteful Warrior, dude. Spiteful yeah. Warrior is a thing with <laughs> is with the what with the Spellstone uh -huh. and Fiery War Axe. Mm -hmm. Oh man, all uh, new meta. Yeah, don't put Brawl <laughs> in there. Brawl's not good. Who would want to brawl a board? I can't imagine. Yeah, it's, <laughs> hmm. Well, before we get down the Wild Warrior speculation train, I want to get off Cinder's crazy train here. We have to ask ourselves that same question we ask every week. How long can this go on? <laughs> what is that? I made that. It's, new. it's a bumper. Oh, I love it. It's, okay. it's Cinder, no one made bumpers since Sarah you left the show. <laughs> I had to it's make great. a bumper and, and make my mark. So... Um, and we needed some Witchwoody music. I wanted some Witchwood. We, we whispered around here, by the way. That's what we do. Okay. Um, so, big thanks to Stefan L for letting us use his cover. Check him out on his channel. Link in our show notes. Big thanks to Hearthstone Top Decks and BeerBrick.com for decklists. Hearthstone Tournaments on YouTube for tournament VODs. Wicked Good and Old Guardian for their tournament analysis. Show notes for this week's episode are on our website, CoinConceed.com. You can monetarily support our show at Patreon.com slash CoinConceed. Join us every week live by following us on Twitch at Twitch.tv slash Podcast. Join our community chats in our Discord at Discord.CoinConceed.com. Write into our email at CoinConceed at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at CoinConceed. And if you would like some CC swag, head on over to our shop at shop.coinconceed.com. Big thanks to our producers, Calum, Viriatus, and... It's so slurpy! And we'd like to continue <laughs> to give a shout-out to our partners at Team Swagoy. You may have heard Brandon Tomlock on last week, and you may hear all of their prominent team members over on THL and they cat or on UHL, and they cast THL sometimes too. Steffi, Edelweiss, Brasky, Anamore, Tomlock... They got they got all of our friends are around, so quite a few people. Um, so big props to Swagoy Gaming. 
Okay. So, Cinder, we don't do shoutouts anymore. We do coin concedes. Okay. So, who would you like to coin concede to this week? Um, I am. I want to coin concede to Epic Ephira. Um, if if you followed the 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 Hearthstone community uh, in in the wake of of Toast the Badger's departure, which I know you guys talked about, so there's no need to open old wounds or fresh wounds. Um, Ephira decided to pick up where Toast had left off and uh, continue trying to promote. Rep- more representation of women in competitive Hearthstone and esports, and uh, she is doing quite a job in the in in the uh, the background right now of putting together something special, uh, and I really really hope that it comes together. Uh, so, uh, if, you're, if you're listening, keep doing what you're doing. You have a lot of fans that you probably don't know you have. That's well said. Thank you, Cinder. Nice coin. You're welcome. Spoticus, who are you going to continue to? Speaking of women who are also filling in in UHL, I'm going to shout out Pear HS today. I, Cinder was the one who directed me to her stream right when she had just started streaming Hearthstone, and I was a fan instantly, and she is now a part of UHL and just played her first match today. I did not get to see the outcome of it, but I'm just really happy that she's now going to be a part of UHL um, going forward, so coin concede to pair. Make sure you check out her stream. It's pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. Big fan. Yeah, it's uh, Cinder actually recommended her to, I think, our, our show originally. We shouted her out a long time ago, and then her stream quality has gone way up as well. She's uh, got a lot of really cool stuff set up. I want a green screen like she has because yeah, it's nice to have a green screen. Um, I'd like to shout out. She also out just out. got signed to a team thing. I, yes. Too, I think. Gravity yes, Gaming, nice. I think. Yeah, she's going to be a streamer content producer. That's great news. Yes. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna give her a Hooray! Yay! Hooray! All right, I have a few coin concedes this week. First of all, mid game as always, we're running the listener league. That guy works like crazy, mm-hmm. and he's really boss. good at it. And I really enjoyed this past Sunday when he's like, "Pairings will be up a little late today. I'm really hungover." It's like, you know what? Respect for the honesty. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to give a shout out to my THL team, the Pod People who I have been a part of now for five seasons. or This is the fifth season under this name, the six if you include Team 1600 Dust. Um, and uh, we won our last week pretty convincingly against the Dad Legend Boys, who are also excellent people, friends of the show. But uh, shout out to the pod people, sometimes referred to as the poo people. And they include a bunch of podcasters. That's where we get the name. So, hype. And then I'd like to give a shout out to everyone that heard Laurel and not Yanni. What if I heard I, both? I heard Laurel. It's, <laughs> if you heard both, it's, come on. Pick a side. Well, I start, like, so my room, I said this in Discord, but my roommate played it for me very, very clearly, heard Laurel, and he heard Yanni. And then my wife came home and played me a video, and it, I heard Yanni. And then she played, like, three more, which I heard Yanni. But then I pulled it up on my phone, and I heard Laurel again. So I don't know. I can't pick a side. The dress is blue and white, not black and gold. Damn it. Wait, or, it's, no, wait, it was or, blue or and black. Blue and blue, blue, blue and black. black. Instead of white and gold. Yes, blue and black I and would... laurel are objectively correct. But but also blue and black was the actual color of the dress. And I read the whereas... article today, whereas this sound was sampled from the dictionary.com version uh, or pronunciation of the word laurel. But okay, it what was does laurel mean. Laurel, like a like a leaf crown. Yeah. Okay. Yep. But then it was recorded back on speakers and played back and recorded again, and then introduced some distortion. And there's actually a tool on the New York Times website where you can slide it uh, to different frequency distortions, different pitches, and it helps you determine where you hear Yanni and where you hear Laurel. And then you can click the button that says where you hear the one that switches, and uh, and it helps them collect data. Yes, I know we've gone off the rails a little bit, listeners, and none of this will be relevant when you go back and listen to this episode, but it is May 17th, 2018, and this is the biggest story we have right now. So, to transition awkwardly, hey, Cinder, where can we find you? Uh, my, my Twitter is, is where I live online. It's at Cinder Ascendant. Check the show notes if you don't know how to spell Ascendant, but if you do, good for you. 
I, I do have a Twitch under the same handle. I although I rarely use it nowadays. Uh, you can find me on Twitch casting for United Hearthstone League and for Team Hearth League on occasion as well. I cast about two to three matches between the two organizations every single week. Uh, and it's a ton of fun. And sometimes with Appa and frequently lately, I've been casting with the golden voice of, of Brasky. And, and that has been a real treat. Yeah. Again, professional actors and voice actors in particular, fun to cast with. Um, and yeah, definitely check out those streams. They are super high quality. The production value for UHL has gone through the roof in a very short period of time. So very impressive to see over there. Um, Bodicus, where can we find you? First of all, just huge thanks to Cinder for coming on this week. It was great having you back on. I, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I know as well. It's, it's this weird fusion for me of old and new of the Cinder Bodicus bridge coming together but yeah, it's there you go. but you know what you can go home again it feels very natural and it's uh cinder i know you consistently lurk around the cc discord and in mm. we, we have been crossing more and more paths in hearthstone communities and we really got to keep doing that but thanks for coming back on buddy uh you're welcome anyway you can find me on twitter i'm at bodicus hs and i actually did a lot of streaming since i was gone for so long i did I streamed for three days in a row, even though my mic didn't even work for one of those days. That's twitch.tv slash Bodicus. Should be streaming a bit more this weekend. Probably more value shaman until I start losing with it a lot and end up playing even shaman or something. Or, I mean, even paladin or something. Man, even paladin's a good deck. But That's for now, good. for now. Uh, as usual, you can find Korra casting Hearthstone at Songbird HS. She'll probably be casting those Collegiate Champs. Uh, you can find Appa on Appa HS on Twitter. And then you can find me on Ridiculous Hat on Twitter and twitch.tv slash Ridiculous Hat on Mondays and Thursdays. That is going to do it for our show. And Ishne Alapara. Hey. Did I get that right? Yes, yes. you did. <laughs> and keep calm and rogue on. And if you see us on the ladder, coin concede. Coin concede. Coin concede. Rest now. He will live for now. Now, your victory proves nothing. The day is yours. I choose death. You have triumphed this time.